acquista tutto. L'amore conquista tutto. Hey there everyone, it's Curly here and a little bit different today, we I'm doing a single intro into the episode. Welcome to the Unfiltered and Undiscovered podcast. And I'm not sure whether this is like a public service announcement or whether it's just a heads up because the conversation that we are going to share with you is just a bottler. It's just a classic. And I really struggled to come up with a name for it. So I've called it An Evening with Chris Mazowak because that's ultimately what it is. It's a conversation that has uh, many twists and turns as we meander through things like European history, eulogy for Chris Bailey. Of course, we've got a, and a greater understanding and a unique way to build your record collection. Uh, the world environment that drove the the foundation around what many would consider the garage band or the punk era. Uh, we got a really good understand, uh, understanding of that and in many ways the different arguments and discussions. Uh, we heard that Chris played his first gigs when he was 13 in Canada and that ultimately that Sydney, for example, is the mecca of Australian music. Um how did the Radio Birdmen survive and thrive when fundamentally they operated outside of the established music industry? And of course, Chris has got a book and it's the Faith and Practice in, in Bedlam. So all these links, of course, all the links for all the music that, we, that we're going to share and all the relevant links to um, Spotify and YouTube videos will, of course, be in the show notes. Now, this conversation just covers so much. Uh, Chris is highly conversive, he's intelligent, and he, what, one of the things that really impressed me was he shared a real respect for the past, but he's not burdened by the past. Um, a lot of artists that we have um, that we read about are burdened by the past. Chris isn't. He respects the past, pays homage to the, the past. He's humbled by his place within the history of Australian music, but he's not burdened by it. And I think that that's a really key critical point for all of us that uh, we can take on board. So I'd just like to recommend strap yourself in, uh, grab a cold drink if that's, uh, if that's what you wish to do, and enjoy this episode, An Evening with Chris Mazowak. here and welcome to episode 59 of the unfiltered and undiscovered podcast let's get right into it let's introduce my favorite co-host the only from co-host adelaide, my only co-host um tate bragg from adelaide how are you braggy oh, i'm really good curly i'm looking forward to easter down here yeah get forward to, well i mean all my days are off i don't have yeah. really i have days off all the time but yeah, looking forward to that. And you've got a couple of gigs, which got is a few, always positive. A few little Adelaide front bar gigs, which is always good. And yeah. um, and we lost another one this week. Yeah, Seems like we every did. week. So before we get into that, let's have a let's introduce our special guest now. Uh, Chris Mazowak, an absolute um, legend in Australian music, Radio Birdman, Screaming Tribesman, New Christ. 
He, and for a Canadian, uh, you know, I, I think to be an Australian legend is, is a pretty good place <laughs> to be. Welcome to the podcast, Chris Mazowak. What, yeah, thank you, what thank you for having me. Chris. Say, what, say that again? I said Buenos Dios, is that right? Buenos Dios, yeah. Buenos Dios. Buenos Dios. <laughs> or, or Hola. Buenos Dios. Yeah. All right, they, so they, they speak the Lego up here too, so. So what's, because you know, it's a it's an autonomous uh, place where you're from, isn't it, of Spain? Is that right? No, no, no. It's it's a, it's a, one of the many provinces. Oh, province, um, okay. I'm, I'm up in the northwest I'm yep. almost at almost at what they used to call the end of the world. Um, <laughs> it's true. In in the medieval times, yeah. um, pilgrims used to waltz down on their pilgrimages, and yeah. um, this area here in Galicia, in the northwest of Spain, was was the end of the um, the civilized world. And right. um, and then they you know they pottered along down to Santiago to Compostela, and, and did their their thing. But um, this this area here is, and and the north of Spain is tremendously different to what you might expect. It's green and lush, and vital. The people are very different. Um, the culture is quite different. But and, you still border Por- you still border Portugal, yeah? We're just we're just above Portugal. Okay. You know, um, mm. Portugal. Well, the whole of the whole of um, Spain used to be Galicia. Back yeah. in the old days, and then you know, as the kingdoms reestablished and asserted themselves, it got <clears throat> it shoved itself into the corner. And Portugal used to be part of that kingdom, but yeah. I actually, oddly enough, I haven't been to Portugal, so that's oh, on, okay. the, on the bucket list. I think. All right, so we did but have, it's, a uh, but it's in... a culture rich in, uh, you know, in, it has a kind of a Celtic heritage. You know, you're fucking bagpipes and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and it's music everywhere. Always music and and yeah. witches, witchcraft, and stuff like that. Oh wow! Because it yeah, was the sound. it was the I know we're getting into history now, not music, but it was like <laughs> it was like the Moors that was that the did the Moors come up through well, that area. What, 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 that's the Moors came into Spain uh, around the, you know seven hundred ish. Yeah, because they were invited. The, 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 uh, Spain had been invaded by the Visigoths. Yes. Who, who were, who who? were a, a, a bunch of barbarians from Germany. Yep. Who sacked Rome and that, yep. They, they were just like normal, you know, right-wing Germans. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and they came and, and, they, and they were giving their in the shits. And so they, the, the Spanish people at that time actually invited the, the Moors to come up and help remove them. And then the, the Moors remained for, you know... A, until the 1400s and yeah. um, and it was it was spain was actually it's really interesting spain was like the center between the dark ages of europe yep where it was you know people were bashing each other they had with sticks and yep. you know and, and there no culture whatsoever and and um, the arab world which had universities and astronomy yeah exactly they were they, they, they missed out on that whole yeah. dark age didn't they they were they were the well the, well the what they did the was they established all these wonderful schools in spain and spain was the cultural center and the language of education and and the academics was yeah. arabic yes and many many fa- fantastic um uh, scholars were actually in fact um spanish and, they, yeah. and of course, all that knowledge filtered eventually up into Europe, but only, you know, reluctantly because you know they didn't like the, um, the yeah Muslim mob. I I, th- I think I just <clears throat> learned more about history in sorry. the last couple of minutes. I, 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 I sorry, Spain. Curly. Spain without Spain, there would be no Europe. Yeah, and then yeah. people don't understand that there would be no culture whatsoever. And there's still yeah. heaps of that um, uh, Arabic architecture there too, isn't there? That. Islamic yeah, but architecture. The first, time, the first time I went down to to well, the first time I was in Spain, we played a concert in the south in Jerez, yeah. and uh, we went to the oldest um, what do they call the oldest mosque in in uh, in Europe. Yeah, and 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 the Arabs had built this this fortress and uh, and a mosque, and they built gardens. And the gardens had flowing water and fountains ah. and baths, Babylon. which, yeah. which mm. was, you know, wow. And, um, and those things are still there. Those fountains are still working. 
Wow. You know? Meanwhile, wow. you know, the Europeans were, you know, <laughs> yeah. wallowing Digging in malaria. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's talk some music. Sorry, so, Kelly. <laughs> now this. No, don't apologise. That was awesome. It's it's good to see other sides to to people. But uh, we lost Chris Bailey this week. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 um, you know, the the guy hung on tenaciously. I gotta say, you know, I I ran into that guy so many times over yeah. the, the decades, decades, and um, he was always you know a kind person. But um, he had he had his proclivities, and um, mm. you know he he, he lived life fully. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I um there was uh, he came from the school which was the sister school or the next door school to the one that I went to. See, he was uh-huh. from Oxley High. So the Saints were huge. Now, I miss the Saints. I was, you know, that was late 70s that they were really sort of kicking on But um, when they when they first started. But, um, yeah, absolutely pivotal in the Brisbane music scene as well as the Australian music scene and, and well before their time. What are your thoughts, Braggy? Well, are they, are they the... I mean, there's always this debate that everyone talks about. Are they the first uh, punk band? You know, mm. or, or is it Birdman, or is it you know, or is it? I don't well, know. Where, you know where did that, that those, those those kinds of arguments are kind of moot because at, at that particular time, all around the world, there was a um, a reaction against you know the music establishment. Mm. You know, mm. young young bands with new ideas were prohibited from doing things. Yeah, and um, so in 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 um, the UK. <clears throat> You had um, their burgeoning, you know, punk scene, mm. um, and you know, all the bands, of course, you know, that go along with that. In America, um, possibly predating that by, you know, microseconds was, you know, first of all, Lenny K um, putting out that Nuggets album and mm. claiming claiming garage that was bands, yeah, garage and, and using the term punk. And all those bands that came from there, but in at the, exactly the same time, we had um, the same thing happening in Australia, where yeah. in 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 Sydney where we were, um, you couldn't get a gig because of the way you looked or because of your audience or the way you sounded or whatever, and you had to have, you know be part of the music establishment and the you know their own little innate culture and that's mm. awful offensive chunka chunka. Aussie boogie that was prevalent then, mm. and up in Queensland you had worse Joe. stuff because you had Joe. Well, yeah, you had you had the police culture, and yeah. you know there was it was dangerous. It was mm. you know it literally was dangerous. So there yeah. was an exodus from Queensland to Sydney. It was all happening at the same time. So you so had so we had there was we no had, first. We had Thatcher in England, and we had I mean, in Queensland. We had Joe. Very yeah. similar ratio. Who, who was? I mean, I don't know my American history that well. Who who was in charge of America at that point? Is that, is that, is that was that the Reagan era? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's I Reagan, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I anyway, think it was. I, can't, yeah. I can't recall. But in well, any I'm, case, all those bands came, and and the and the and the mecca at that particular time was Sydney, and yeah. and even more so because by that stage, Birdman had established itself as the you know, the, the that, because it, it flouted all convention, you know, it put mm. on its own shows, it put on its own tours, it went around the music industry to the point where it had its own venue. And in yeah. that venue, um, it allowed all these bands who otherwise would never get a gig to come. And the Saints were one of those bands that came down and mm. played at, at the Funhouse. So it was all, all much at the same time and there's you know if everyone was supposed to be cooperating and and um the saints weren't <laughs> they, yeah they, they were they were kind of it was odd they they kind of were even though they were like sleeping on our drummer's you know couch <laughs> um chris chris bailey was sleeping at, at, at uh where the blues point road and um even though you know they were getting Offered, you know, you know the, the little key to the city. They were kind of um, not gracious about it, 
And it was like they were, you know, deliberately going out of the way to be turds. And, and they, they were making a lot of friends there, despite <laughs> all this, you know, offering. And, and of course, then they buttered off to the UK and, and, um, and the rest was history, really. But uh, it was a c- colorful time. So going back before that, Chris, I want to know what brings a 15-year-old, because I think you were 15 at the time, all the way from Canada, all the way down to the bottom of the earth. Yeah, I, I, I wondered that myself many times. <laughs> I, 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 you know, ever since that time, I've been a, a perpetual um, immigrant. You know, I, I, I'm an outside person. Did but, you pick, um, pick up the guitar early on, though? Or I had I had been playing in Canada. You know, my first gig was um, when I was 13. I, I, I was living in a town called Micah Creek, and we had. Um, Two drummers, so there were two drummers in the band, and there was an eighteen-year-old guitar player, um, and my bass player Dave, um, who I'm still in contact with, was um, fifteen or sixteen, and um, <clears throat> and because I was thirteen, I had to get permission to play in the bar, so the, wow. the bar and bar and, <laughs> yeah. um, and and dances and stuff, but um, I was. Technically, technically, at 13 or 14, the most proficient. So I got to be the lead guitar player, and somehow, <laughs> the, and somehow that translated to being the singer as well. So um, it was trial and tribulation. And you had two drummers. Was well, that, inten- drummers, was that intentional? In or, oh, okay. No, there I was, see. There were yeah. two drummers in town. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know, everyone I get was it. in. And we had, the, we had a fantastic system. We had. We had a little setup in our basement, and we had PA, and everyone had these big amps and stuff. And it was just fun. And what are, you listen, what are you listening to on the radio up there? What are, they, what are you playing at those first gigs? Oh, back in those days, oh, jeez. Um, Neil Young and... and um, oh, yeah, like guess everybody else is doing, yeah. Well, Can, yeah, Canadian and, stuff. and, you know, Garden Party by Rick, um, Rick Nelson. And, oh, yeah? And, and um, what else, you know... Johnny Cash, you know, country and western stuff. Commander Cody. Okay. You know, wow. Usual, you know, bar stuff. Pretty, pretty common garden variety stuff. And <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until I came to Australia that that I really started to um, listen to other things. So, and I bought was... albums. I bought albums on the basis of the guitars on the cover. So you know, I, <laughs> I, I went to the, I'd go to the music store and rifle through all the, you know, all the stuff. Yeah, as you did in those days, you'd go through the bin and say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And if there's a picture of a guitar, I buy it. So you know, <laughs> open up the humble pie rock in the Fillmore, and there's guitars everywhere. Well, I'm buying that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. You know, and, and, so, and you know, picture of uh, what else was there? Mark Bowen, uh, Electric Warrior. It's got a picture of you know, a big amp and a guitar. And I, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna buy that for sure. So that, Excellent. That, that was the only criteria. If I had a guitar on the cover, I bought it. Yeah, I, and I suppose that's opening that's... you up to so many different musical genres and influences. And well, it's an interesting way to to establish a record collection. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> there's a lot of <laughs> shitty guitar players up there too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you got to have you can get anything from Hank Marvin to freaking, you know. <laughs> Yeah, not that, I, not that I, Hank Marvin was shitty, but you know. I, I, I want to say, I want to mention some names, but I <laughs> you know what I'm going to I'm going to the air on the side of air on the side of dignity. Mm. <laughs> so you've got a book coming out. It's called Faith and Practice in Bedlam, and it's a a bird a book about the Birdman from a Birdman. So tell us a little bit about those days with the with Radio Birdman. Well, well, for, first of all, the book is, is not specifically about um, the band, although of course that comes in because it's you yeah. know it's broadly autobiographical. But um, <clears throat> what happened was, and this obliquely answering your question, um, was I I had been you know writing bits for a long time, and by bits I mean little vignettes, you know observations, not mm. not particularly long stories or anything, but short, you know, and pithy observations. Yeah, and. Uh, and this fellow from Adelaide, Adelaide Robert Brokenmouth, who you might know, no. um, 
No, no, he's, he's a sort of a, a artist in his own right and, and writer. Okay. And um, and he, uh, he, he, I don't know how he got in contact with me. I think he came and saw some Hitman shows. And we got to talking and, we, you know, we started talking about literature because musicians are stupid people and, and it's hard to find an intelligent conversation and I found an intelligent conversation. So why wow, we're talking literature? And um and he, and I mentioned that I was writing and he said, Oh, I'd like to see some of that. And I showed him a little bit and um and he encouraged me to collect them all. So over the course of a few years I collected all my bits. Yeah. And and he said, You've got a book here. Mm, and I went wow. but, uh, I, Okay, what do I do with this thing? And he said, oh, look, I'll, I'll put it together for you, and and um, and we'll find a way to put it out. And I went, oh, okay. And and uh, for better or worse, this is what happened. So it's yeah. you know it's not necessarily explicit. You know, there are bits and observations. People reveal themselves for who they are through yeah. their own actions and their and, and their and um, you know their own words, so to speak. And um, and in fact, I, I rarely mention names. I, I don't I don't spill the beans particularly. If that's okay. what people are looking for. And and it also tracks my my own personal evolution, if you want to call it that. Um, yep. Because I I'm as brutal to myself as mm. you know anyone else. So yeah. it's self observational and and as as honest as you know prepared to be. <laughs> So it, it's it's interesting, um, mm. but you know, as far as Birdman goes, getting back to the whole one of freaking question. Um, That's all right. It's good. <laughs> I I came into Australia. <clears throat> this no one had heard of this place before. You know, we knew mm. we knew Skippy the Bush Kangaroo, and we knew yeah. White You know, six white boomers, and that was about it. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and so you get to Australia and. There's an impenetrable language because then Australian still sounded fucker. You yeah, know, and you're like you're Australian. like down in Maroubra. Yeah, <laughs> like, you could get any more fucking Maroubra. Australian. <laughs> south, south, south Maroubra, which was at oh. the end of the end of the world. The only yeah. thing, the only thing further uh, than that was um, La Perouse, and no one dared go there for some reason. That was the that was like you know British. And, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we were at the end of the world and, and didn't understand anything, didn't understand the culture, had to go to school, had to go to high school, yeah. to finish my last year of high school. And and I was a, a you know, I was an exceptional student. I used to get awards and things at school. And um, and suddenly, I, this pedagogic system came, you know, into my face. And um, I didn't understand what they wanted, you know. Then, what's your opinion of Hamlet? And in, in North America, that you know, your education is that you you try to it's like a puppy dog. <laughs> you, you try to find you try to find um, about about your subject, and then from you know an established point of view, express what you believe. Well, that's not what happened in Australia. What they wanted to hear was what they told you, and I didn't realize that. So I spent a mm. year not doing what I was told and failed dismally. And um, and luckily by that time I had started to go see a band at um, at uh, the Fun House and yep. followed them around for quite some time. Yeah. And then when the keyboard player um, left left, um, uh, I was in just almost in because I knew the songs. The band knew me. We had infiltrated our way into this into their inner sanctum so efficiently yeah. that there was no other choice you know you know there yeah. was no question i was just in the band so Uh, 
Um, and and um, you on your, your album, like I just noticed a, a, um, Address to the Nation, there's a song called FFS where you talk about the fun house and you're not young anymore. Is that you? Do you get sick of talking about the fucking, you know, the, the Birdmen and, and stuff or? Oh, no, no, because it's part no. of the, her- the, the heritage mm-hmm. and the legacy and we did some, you know, tremendous things. And yeah. Um, and you know a lot of those a lot of the songs are tongue in cheek you know yeah yeah I, I don't I don't admire the you know the characters in the scene but um, there's okay. no doubt that we had we at that particular time there was a true sense of camaraderie and brotherhood mm, and yeah. um, us against the the world yeah and, and yeah. it was a very special time. And, and, we were, and, you know, and I was very young. You know, I was a young guy from the, you know, Canadian mountains, and I, you know, yeah, at the bottom you know? of the world, and people yeah. are going jumping around, going crazy in yeah. mm. sweat, sweaty pubs. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah, it's um, I miss the Birdmen. I mean, uh, that, at the time the Birdmen were, you know, gigging around. I was in primary school and I, I thought Hush was the greatest band in the world at that particular moment <laughs> in my time. So that gives you a bit of an indicator. But but one of the things when I look back on some of the docos that have been done about the Birdman, and there's one in particular, that descent into Maelstrom that's pulled together some ABC information. And there's there's Mazowak on stage with his aviators and the old knit footy jersey. <laughs> right. So, yeah. that so was a, as, as far as as, Bay as, High School. Yeah, so as distinct from, so far removed from what anyone would consider to be the punk attire. And, and I think that's one of the things that really grabs people nowadays when they go back and they look at that. So you've got such a diverse mix of personalities in that band. Well, you know, you have to realise that there was, there, there couldn't be punk in, a, in Australia, truly, mm. because you had a really healthy doll system you know so people who were out of work or who wanted to be out of work could do it very happily and it was yeah. comfortable and you had sun and you had surf and you know so some of us surfed in my case very badly but um you know it was a it was a culture that did not engender um you know that kind of militancy like you mm-hmm. know they did we didn't have things to complain about particularly like they did in england except for maybe you know up in you know, Brisbane, where the police were pounding on you incessantly. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't think punk could exist in Australia. I think there was one punk, and and, and, and that punk was Bob Short. Bob Short's sort yeah. of become a bit of a pundit now. But yeah. um, he was the he was the only punk, and, and, and he had to go to England to express his punkness. <laughs> so... <laughs> so- like I'm, I'm the same as Curly. I grew up in Townsville, right up in North Queensland. So, you know, I, I grew up on on fucking pop music. You know, I'm, so uh, uh, and there was there was no underground scene. So why? Yeah. What attracts people to that? Is it the exclusivity of it? Like I, I'm the only people who know this band, or is it the truthfulness of the of it? I I don't think it's the exclusivity. Um, what what was very apparent was that. Um, there, there was no one place for a scene as such. The scene was wherever the band took it. So okay. if, if we played at the fun house, the scene was there. If we played at whatever you know the what the hell's the name of the pub, something on the northern beaches, and the and the yeah. and the hunters oh. came up there, that's where the scene was. So it wasn't okay. as if you know there was one specific place. It was where the band took it. And you have to remember the kind of music that w- was dominant there was the stuff that you see on Countdown, which yeah. is like fuck, you know, you know, there was, you know, the big band was Sherbet, yes, and then you know these there's this utter shit like Hush and yeah. fucking, and, <laughs> and, and, and Skyhooks, who, you know, all these bands are regarded as, <clears throat> you know, as as wonderful, and everyone's looking back yeah. at nostalgia, but it was the most rinky dink unrock and roll. Garbage, mm. you know, in our minds and, yes, and yeah. in our fans' minds, and it was just—I mean, sorry to be I don't know, you're, you're no, 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 you would I, never do I, that. I, I like—I mean, I like bubblegum music, so you know what, what can I say? Yeah, but um, 
but you know, it, it was this, you know, it was so unrock and it was so, um, you know, fake and phony and contrived. And, yeah. and, and we wanted to play something that wasn't out there and we had to create it ourselves. Mm. You know, we didn't want to cover other bands because we didn't like other bands' music and we didn't like yeah. their management. We didn't like the touring company and we didn't like their freaking pubs, you know, and, you know, we had to yeah. do everything ourselves. And I think that's what resonated. You know, it was like, suddenly there's something else. Yeah. And all isn't, it, came, you know. isn't it funny how now, you, you can, like like you just said before, you guys found your own venue, you played whatever songs you fucking wanted to play, you, you did everything yourself. I yeah. don't know if you put, the, I, I, I guess you, when the records came out, you guys, you know, had... Yeah, uh, we stamped yeah. all those stupid little symbols on each one. Yeah, and, and, and now, <laughs> it's almost like that now you can freaking get your song out there, even though there's yeah. a trillion, billion other people doing the same thing on Spotify. Yeah. But someone yeah. can sit and leave all that behind, I guess... I guess the man still has you with Spotify though now. So, mm, well, yeah, uh, and 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 the thing is, most, you know, all the, all the new bands, well, from from what I'm hearing, um, are not in it for their love of music. They're in it for the the clicks, the likes, yeah. and they're yeah, all yeah. using the same. They're using the same technology, the same algorithms, the same plugins, you know, the same programs, and and the music. It's generic again, you know, and they, mm. and they all call themselves punk. And you, you go see, you know, you read guitar magazines and you go, who are these guys? And you go listen to their music and it's just this generic, you know, whatever kind of music. And they, and they say, oh, we love two maps. We love, you know, the old sound of punk, the most punk guitar players in the world, blah, blah, blah. And it's just all these really pedestrian um, guys that, you know, go back, listen to some records, steal a bunch of ideas, and then, you know, put it out on a mm. generic platform. So know? can it happen again? Like, you know, music's always been like that. It's been, you know, you had the crooners of the 40s, and then rock and roll came along, Elvis Presley, and just stuck it, stuck it up. Them. And then, you know, we, we went through, and then, you know, we get, we, you, get to the, you get to the British punk scene where everyone, br you know, after all those... Um, yeah, prog, yeah. Prog, prog, prog rock bands, yeah, yeah. yeah. and then and then and then, fi and then finally you get to grunge, you get to Nirvana, and and then I guess a certain extent you get, uh, hip hop kind of, kind of does the same thing. Uh, Fuck mm. you. Is it going to happen again, or is it happening and we don't know about it? I don't know. Well, it has to, and I think there are a bunch of young younger bands that are you know coming out now in in Australia. You know, you, you start to mm. see, you start to see a little bit of action. You know, and mm. um, and because the whole live music scene is dead. Yes. You know, they're having to create their own venues and places again. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, even if you go back to, you know, you said the crooner thing, rock and roll killed the crooner, crooners. Actually, that's not true. Okay. You know, they killed the crooners. <laughs> Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby <laughs> was the guy who, you know, the king of crooners. Yes. He, he wiped the crooner because before... Bing Crosby, it was all that strident tenor, whoa, you know, kind of oh, yeah, 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 yeah. guy, Rudy Valley with his megaphone and all that crap. And, yeah, um, yeah. and, 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 um, then they invented this microphone, this yes. wonderful new mic. And Bing Crosby discovered that you could sing really close and softly and intimately, and that killed everybody. He well, Frank did over. that too, though, didn't he? Well, Frank was, was after Bing. Bing was the king. Yeah, okay. Yeah, here, here, being cool. But um, you know, he was the acknowledged king, and and Frank was riding on his coattails. And of course, he, uh, you know, he outlasted him by a long time. Yeah. But um, I mean, here Frank, I... Frank, Frank went from career to career as well. He went through his ups and downs. You know. So. Yeah. He survived. So here, all the way here, I here I thought I was going to get lost in talks about guitars and I'm, I'm getting lost in talks around crooners so that's all right and now Chris one of the last question I guess from me around the Birdmen so Birdmen were inducted in the Hall of Fame fantastic you look at the influence in the Sydney music you know even today the the influence is there how do you feel about that lasting legacy of the Birdmen well I think it's something that um, we have to um, be humble about and and yeah. and and to uh, feel proud about you know and to um, to curate carefully you know we 
we did some wonderful things. Yeah. And um, and we really need to, you know, be um, respectful of all that stuff. Mm. And I think that's where the problem is now. You know, it's become a um, more of a, you know, a, a vanity project than than a a musical, okay. you know, a musical legacy. And, yeah. Um, you know that that's the that's the the sad, you know, the the, the sad state of events. But um, otherwise, I think you know we're in this we're in the position where we are now the guys who are um, you know helping the next generation along. I mean, for example, you know when I when I play with my band at the yeah. the Debato Wave Riders here, yeah, um, and we're called the Debato Wave Riders because surf is fantastic along the whole coast of um, Galicia, yeah, and and the one place there is no surf is. In <laughs> oh, what? Because I, I, I Google, I went on the Google Earth, and I actually went down to Street View to Viera because I just because I thought, wow, this is such a small little place, you know. And oh yeah, yeah. So what? Is it yeah. no? Is it because of the like that? They've got those bays that come kind of in a little bay there, aren't you? Yeah, it's like a little estuary, and it's yeah. an old medi. It's an old medieval fishing village. And do you play there yeah. much? Do you play in there, or do you? Or do you band play no, out no, and around? No, no, no. Not a not a lot, you know. A lot. COVID has killed everything pretty much. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's going to start up again. I, you know, we're going to play at the Resurrection Fest here. You know, okay. we have this tiny village, and it has one of the biggest um, metal thrash um, festivals in, in the world. I mean, we had the, the last time they had the thing. It was like Scorpions, Kiss, um, Iron Maiden. <laughs> Um, Motorhead did, I think maybe the second to last show here. Um, you know, like big stuff. So we're, yeah. we're on we're on that bill in cool. uh, j- July. I mean, this is three of us. It's two local guys, uh, El Cara, uh, our drummer, and Abe Ibram Carujo. He's on on bass, and they're local. You know, they're the local feral lads, and um, and we and we. You know, play whenever we can. But as I was going to say, you know, it's part of this heritage thing. You know, when we play, you know, there's all these young guys that are so they're dripping rock. You know, they're just. Yeah. I mean, Europeans are fashionistas big time. You know, they do all the posing <laughs> and stuff, but they don't get it. They just they mostly can't. It's the French yeah. impossible. They can't play at all. But um, but they love rock and roll and they love the fashion and they look more Johnny Thunders than anyone you know, on the planet, and, um, you know, they're really deep into that stuff. So they, they rock up with these big amps and the gazillion oh, yeah, yeah. and, you know, they're just <laughs> in leather, and they just look at, and they look at us, and it's like, this, this, you, can, you, can, you can taste the disdain, you know, <laughs> yeah. and us dirty, dirty old men with their shitty equipment. And, uh, and then at the end of the gig, they're all crowding around and they're asking questions. How do you get that sound? What is How that? How do you get you know, that, that tone out of that? Wow, yeah, exactly. Man. You know? Mm. And, you know? And they got these huge marshals, you know, with the 70 buttons on them. And I go, well, one volume, you know, <laughs> turn it up. <laughs> yeah. Guitar, volume, volume, you know. Yeah, Pe- just, uh, just, change the channel on my amp. Is that yeah, just, Is that, do you have many effects, it. Chris? Or you just... I, I don't have a channel. I don't, I don't have any channel switching. I, I get like my one. I got like one sound, which I get with you know pretty much any guitar I use. Yeah. I just yeah. crank the living daylights of the amp, and um, and because that annoys the sound guy, my amp's only like thirty watts, and it's a Spanish amp. It's a George. It's like a. It's named George. George T amp. It's the best <laughs> thing I've ever used. Mm-hmm. It's like a Fox AC30 that okay. doesn't blow up every. That doesn't blow up every gig. Yeah, I'll get and a Fox. This, this guy's. This guy's built this fabulous amp for me and, and it's got like you know volume and and um and i put a piece of plexiglass over one of the speakers and with some holes to let the sound pressure out to keep the sound guy from yelling at me you know and and you know i make a point of saying hey i got you a present here look you know so you don't yell and they think that's nice so they, they you know so that's like most... a boutique amp maker like a class wiring this all yeah it's, i have a choice class a b or class a. Oh, okay so I run Class A because, you know, there's two shortage now, so I want to burn them out. Yeah, I know. I've heard that. Russia, you know what he said. <laughs> and, hey. um, 
And so, you know, I've got this app, and all these kids come up and go, what? So, uh, you know, and I do have a secret weapon. I use um, I use a little, um, what do you call it, a Seymour Duncan pickup boost. Right. Which puts the signal into your app with great velocity, and it makes your um, tubes hurt. And it just <laughs> and it doesn't... And it doesn't doesn't change the sound, but it just makes things, you know, easier for me. You know, mm, okay. It's more psychological than anything. So that's about it. This thing, and then I have a a couple of bells and whistles for like lead breaks and stuff, but not much. And these you, you, kids are you all guys going, still yeah. sound. Yeah, I mean, it's I've you know, all the stuff I've listened to from the Wave Riders. I didn't know they were called the Wave Riders because there's no waves. That's cool, but. Yeah. Um, and oh, and that's a, I have one question written down here. Why have you got Henry the Octopus on your drum kit? Oh, well, because Galicia's, you know, it, it, it's oh. it's all about seafood and oct- uh, the octopus is, is the thing. And, and you know, my head is like an octopus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I just thought, why have they got Henry the Octopus on there? So that's oh, no, a bit that of seafood. The, that, okay, what's the name of the guy that did that? Um, um, the Wiggles. <laughs> There's a famous cartoonist that did that drawing. From oh, me. oh, that octopus. Yeah, it's, it's not Mel Blanc. Not, not Mel Blanc. It's, um, no, it's very Fleischman. You know, you know, it's very forties looking. I think you guys sound really Australian, though. Well, you, you, yeah, I, you sound I it's all... like Aussie pub rock. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. I love. Is that a bad yeah. compliment? Do you take no, offence I mean, to that? I mean, I mean just your—it's your guitar playing because it's—it's got that angelsy fucking hoodoo gurus, you know, attack to it. You attack it. Well, I mean, they, those guys have my attack. I don't <laughs> <think they're... laughs> I, Best answer, I yeah. Them. And I tell everyone, if you want to sound like an Aussie band, all downstrokes, even if it makes you yes. Think. So, are Maybe. we going to? Do we have to credit you for the Aussie sound of rock, a Canadian? Much. So, are you... pretty much. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. We cool. when, when we were in Birdman and playing at the Fun House, it was a matter of honor to do yeah. those songs at that speed. All downstrokes and yeah, and well, TVI. It's a much better version, I have to say, than the Stooges. Well, I mean, it's a different version, you know. But, yeah, it's better you know, for me. No, I love it. It's no, faster, you know. Well, it's different. It's definitely mm. But you know, um, Ron Ashton is still, you know, one of my favorite guitar players, and um, and uh, still a great inspiration. Yeah, mute it, mute it, and downstrokes. That's possible. Awesome. <laughs> Downstroke. Uh, even if you're bleeding and. Sweating and throwing up, you know. <laughs> oh, that's cool. All right. So one of the things that we noticed about the Birdman and, and I guess the continuing, um, I, I suppose, business of the Birdman, we, we, um, when we talked to Mick Madu, he, he spoke about when he first went to Sydney and he started working um, in an animation studio that was owned by the bass player. We see oh, yeah. you and other members of the band are doing a lot of the production for some of that Sydney music around in the 80s. So yeah, was yeah. that um, was that come about naturally? I mean, or was it all part of, um, I, I suppose, it, it seems like an intelligent strategy that a lot of other bands don't do. Well, I mean, a lot of bands wanted 
to have that, you know, that approach, you know, that attitude. And, um, and, and so they, you know, they, they asked us, but, you know, a lot, a lot of that was, um, a lot of that sound was really attributable to, to people like Alan Thorne, who, mm. um, who was the engineer and co-producer on a lot of, of the stuff that we did. You know, yeah. he really, he was a really um, a great ear, and and you know, and he really understood what we were, you know, aiming for. You know, he he, yeah. he was completely open to, you know, doing pretty much anything we wanted to at the stupid hours that we could get, you know, cheap studio time, and um, yeah, and you know, so a lot of that music that we created was. You know, between what's in the closing hours from studios, you know, it was overnight. So, for example, that those early um, tribesmen um, singles, singles that I produced yeah. were done overnight. Did everything okay. in one night, you know, and so it was like, okay, let's let's work out a format. How can we do this efficiently and quickly, yeah. but still, you know, keep the energy up? And so we we established a kind of a a template for. You know all the stuff we recorded in over the years, and and we could we can create that sound pretty much anywhere. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's so hitman. It? It's funny Let's when you, you when you're young. Those you know, everyone always likes the old stuff better than the new stuff. And I'm yeah. wondering, is it why is it is it is it because when you're young, you, you you're artistic. Uh, I think it's because there's an alchemy when you're young. You know, when you're when you have a band, it's everything it's, it's some of all the parts. So, for example, you take a song like um, let's take a really good example, "Descent into the Mad Strong." Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's got um, a bass playing, bass line uh, with extraordinary velocity. It's got drumming that that's as good as any of the best um, surf drumming on, ever recorded you know it's got guitar playing that's just on the on the edge of everyone's abilities and limits and technical you know skills you know yeah. and it's everyone all together but there's one credit and i think eventually over time mm. the person that gets that one credit forgets all about the other people that are contributing yeah and, oh, okay and and people get fed up you know, and they go, well, yeah. in actual fact, you know, getting a bit tired of the situation. And that's that's kind of, I think that's what happens. So, you know, yeah. like, for example, in my band, I might, I might spend three months making a song, or I might spend ten minutes making a song. You know, yeah. it's, mm. it's the luck of the draw. But mm. everyone gets a credit. Yeah. Because okay. everyone's playing on it. Yeah, you know, yeah, and 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 everyone's and, playing their their part it, the way they play their part, not the way play you play it. their part. That's right. And so mm. you go and record. You're not playing everything, you know. You're no. not drumming. So mm. shut the fuck up.
And, you know, <laughs> and, and you have to acknowledge the input of everybody, you know? Yeah. Mm, yeah. And, and when you start to believe in your own mythology, you know, that that's, means that you're only using people for their ability, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and no one likes that. Yeah. So, um, you know, part, part of the reason those things sound so great in, in retrospect is because it's alchemical. You yeah. know, it's all the disparate parts put into a, a, a crucible and then superheated to intolerable, mm. you know, levels. And, and it is either a transformation or everything gets destroyed. And in yeah. Birdman's case, um, both, both, both things happened, you know, and, and likewise, <laughs> likewise with the hitman, you know, it, yeah. you know, what, what's, what's, what's that, what's come out of that? Band recently, you know, a song about fisting or something. I don't know. Oh my god! <laughs> so, so talking about a, a couple of things. So, so the Birdman sort of did everything outside of the establishment, and then we see the video clip of the Hitman on Countdown. So, <laughs> yeah. what was the experience well, like? Countdown, like you? Yeah, well, you know, we came, we came back, and 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 I had started writing songs in in Europe. For you know, because I knew that that I wasn't going to maintain myself in, in Radio Birdman, so I started writing and came back to Australia and formed the Hitman. Yeah, and we wanted to go in and, and and we did a bunch of demos, and we wanted to more or less pick up where Birdman finished, but carry on, you know, and take that music, take the inner city into the suburbs, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and and. Our producer at that time, which was Charles Fisher, um, was determined that we were going to sound like the Cars because they were really hip at that moment. And they have the downstroke. Uh, and we and we couldn't music. <laughs> and we couldn't shift that mentality, you know. So we were desperately heading in that direction. He is desperately trying to get us to go elsewhere. Uh, okay. And mm. we ended up on Countdown with a song that everyone seems to really like, but which was really not representative of where we were wanting to go. Yeah. It wasn't until we did that first, that first album with the red cover, the, our first, mm. you know, al mm. self-titled album that we actually sounded like what we wanted to sound like. Yeah. And I still think yeah. that's the most representative sound mm. of, of that band. In a magazine We talked about the places That you see With another guy That I know You left me all alone You didn't tell me The live album Tora Tora DDK is a great representation and didn't tell the man is such a better version on the live album than what it yeah, ever yeah. was recorded in yeah. um, in the countdown well, days. The, the Hitmen were, you know, really a product of that pop scene. You know, we played mm. six, seven um, days a night, um, sometimes twice a night uh, for years, well, decades really. And, mm. um, and, and, you know, we were a band that could just turn on a dime in the end. And um, the, that live album, it's technically flawed, but we rescued what we could. And, yeah. um, you know, it's a, it was really, this that was really a post-Hitman album. Because yeah. the singer had had his um, car accident and the band was finished. And, um, and so that was our way of saying goodbye to the fans because we really never had a chance mm. to you know do that properly so you know that it was that kind of mix between being the hitman and 
and the new Christs, you know, mm. and, and the new Christs were the hitmen. You know. So um, it was a and, exciting, and, exciting time. And so, and somewhere in that mix, you spent a large amount of years with the tribesmen. Well, you know, but at, at some stage, it was pretty apparent that the the new Christs were just not going to happen. Mm. Um, the personality thing was, was getting in the way. Um, the musicians were just not in, at all happy. You know, one of the most, yeah. the thing that I love most is recording. And, and, and my decision came when, um, when we were recording and all the, all of our ideas kept on getting poo pooed. you know, and, and when I'm recording, I think my philosophy is try it. Even if it's a stupid idea, try mm. it. Because Shit, that's, what, that's what the freaking Beatles did. Work. Yeah, try it. Yeah, and give it so, a go. Yeah, give it a shot. And if, and if it sounds stupid or it doesn't work or people don't like it, well, that's that. Yeah. And, um, and that wasn't going to happen. kind of the limbo and I got the offer okay. from the tribesmen so mm -hmm. um, so I went okay I, I did it it wasn't because I wanted fame and fortune as some people like to pretend it, it was because you know certain personalities were impossible and yeah. still and still are but um, you just wanted freedom I wanted um, not to have hassle really yeah that's what I meant yeah and, and so we went to went over to the tribesmen, and even then, it took a while to to cement a, um, a lineup and a direction, and it, and it came together eventually. And we did that whole you know date with the vampire thing, which is yeah. People, you know, people used to, other bands used to come to us and ask us how we got the sound on that. I love that track. <laughs> you know, That's and, a good and, track. And it's no secret; it was the same. The same thing we always did, you know. Just those little secrets of like Christmas all again. <laughs> and <laughs> apart from the book, Chris, what like what's has has um, the COVID been fruitful for you songwriting wise? Are you oh, gonna, is there another got, Wave Riders album? I've got way too many songs. I've got a, a <laughs> quite a, I've got quite a few projects. So you know, the first the first thing is at the moment my drummer's up in Norway. He's he's got a job he's training in. Uh, in freaking Norway, so we're kind of in a sabbatical. Um, so our first um, order of business will be to um, get in to rehearse for some recording because we've got a whole backlog of songs. Cool. And so, so we got that. Um, I've got a project with some guys in Australia, which um, is more along the the hitman line. So. Um, It'll have like a lead singer, and and um, and it'll be that you know great, great Aussie rock thing. I've yep, got yep. a I've got a, um, a garage band. There's a bunch of guys from another village here, and uh, it's it's a, actually an old Roman village because the Romans mm -hmm. came through here and pillaged and <laughs> raped their way, and um, and it's an old Roman village. And it's called Lugo. And it's got a Roman wall completely around the, the city and, um, well, small town. And, um, and these guys are, are like garage band fiends. So I'm, I'm playing in a You're garage irrepressible, band with these guys. <laughs> and then I got a tour in, um, in September through France with a, an Australian band, the Prehistorics. Okay. Which is a very, you know, very enthusiastic um 
bombastic kind of rock band. And then I'm hoping to get to Australia at the end of the year mm. um, for a, for a run and to you know support the book. Yep. Um, yeah. So this this year's got a bit more action than the last few because yeah, you know, the yeah. COVID things just eradicated all you know. Yeah, we know. Everything. Yeah. And in fact, and I'm we'll just getting, sure. I, I, I had COVID like uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, I've had it. I think I think Curly, you haven't had it yet, have you? No, I think I'm immune to it. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm pretty sure I had it at the very beginning because I had a weird something. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but here in in Europe, in Italy and Spain in particular, like, it was no joke. The, the hospitals were overflowing. Yeah. Mm. The, the army was carting away. Uh, bodies in the dead of night wow. so that they wouldn't freak out the population. Shit. Um, oh. s- s- Morgues were completely overflowing, so they had to use skating rinks for the bodies. Oh, um, my was, goodness. You know, and, and, and we we were, you know, it was truly dangerous here. So when we mm. had lockdown, everyone went into lockdown. We all yeah. went into our homes and locked down, and at 6 o'clock at night, we'd all come on the balcony and cheer and clap in support yeah. for each other. And um, and we were astonished at how America and Australia responded with this, you know, libertarian right wing bullshit. Oh man! You know? And we were just going, you guys have. No I know. Fun mm. They didn't realize do. how. Yeah, I agree. Damn, no people are dying, and, and but that's just Australia's so fucking laid back about everything. Just yeah, it, it was Be- it was criminal. And you look, mm. you know, America's the same, and they have. And they had don't they don't those guys don't have universal health care. I mean, Spain. Mm. This is the wonderful thing. Spain has, you know, this reputation for being anarchic and you know being lazy and you know yeah, lazy yeah, yeah. fair and everything and, and and political corruptness and you know all this kind of stuff. And, and in a way, it's kind of true. But it also has the best doctors in Europe. You know, people people come to Spain to train. You know. People, oh, that's cool. People hire um, European doctors in, everywhere because they're better trained and nurses, you know. And so you go into a hospital here, and you know it's just this carefully controlled anarchy. And you, you know, you would go, "What the?" <laughs> you know, it's just mayhem. <laughs> but the actual quality of care is beyond excellent. So yeah. you know that's the thing that kept us, you know, afloat. Just the incredible. Mm. You know, healthcare system and the determination of the people in that system not to let people succumb. You know, they would work harder than they needed to to keep people going. And so, when we watch what was happening in Australia, you, you guys yeah. are just living in a bubble. You know, mm. and it's you know, it's, when that True. tsunami hits, it's going to be awful. Mm. Anyway, we hope the, the nature of viruses is they mutate. You know, yeah. at, 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 a, at an unbelievable rate. You know, the, when you create a vaccine for a virus, it's already redundant the next day. You know, it's yeah, a yeah. virus. You know, so you know, antigenic shift, antigenic drift, and there's no way that's the same virus that the vaccine is mm. for. So there's, you know, in three years we've, you know, we've got a completely different monster, and um, yeah. and and it looks as though this this particular little monster is no more virulent than you know a normal flu. flu. The good yeah. thing is you yeah. know, wearing masks, washing your hands, and being a decent human being is oh. the thing that, it's the thing yeah. that works. Not all this, uh, uh, you know. Who would have thought that? Yeah. Well, here in, here in Adelaide uh, tomorrow, yeah. we, fo- we finally don't have to wear the mask tomorrow here in Adelaide, but I'll guarantee that so many people will still yeah. wear the mask when they're on the public transport. It's just, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, you know, been, Asia's yeah. always, like Japan, you go to Japan, they always wear masks when they're sick. Yeah. And it, yeah. Hopefully, yeah, it's he'll consider- realize. It's called consideration for, for each yeah. other. Consideration for each other. Yeah. Um, for Chris. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Chris, I, I know we're coming up close to an hour at the moment, so um, we will make sure the link is in the show notes for people to pre order your book. I know that I've actually pre ordered a oh, copy, so I'm looking for, for it to come out. Looking forward to seeing all these other little projects. Um, and I, I just really. Um, before we say goodbye, I just really thank you for coming on the, the yeah. podcast and just um, 
humour us as we do a segment now which we call The Undiscovered Seven Inches and, and where we just talk about an old single or an old record. Sure. We both they're not really deep. undiscovered, they're all discovered. But yeah. <laughs> Well, they're getting more discovered. <laughs> yeah, because we're so, running out. <laughs> so you've got the 12-inch this time, Braggy. So well, I've got, well I've, are you going first? I'll go first. So I've got two. Yeah. And this is just uh, in honour of the of Chris Bailey, the Saints, just like Firewood. It was the the actual first album I bought of the the Saints. So didn't know a great deal of them before that song came out. And this is one that should have some memories there for Chris. Oh it's, yeah, uh, yeah. Booty Lust, Kathy's on Heat, produced by Chris Mazowak, the boy yeah. from Brisbane. So. Yeah. Awesome. Right, nice. and, and, yeah, and, yeah. That, and that particular song by the Saints is probably my my favorite Chris Bailey song. I, I really well, like that song. Well, Springsteen covered that, didn't he? Yeah, he did, know. actually. Yeah, Spr- yeah Springsteen you know, covered that, I'm pretty sure. Well, yeah. Curly Bot. Some really wonderful bits and pieces during yeah. that stage. Yeah. yeah. Curly, you know, recently I've been doing, because we've been counting the shows and we're up to 59. Yeah. So I've been trying to find some sort of thing in music that suits the number. Like last week, we had 58, so we had the SM58 microphone. So <laughs> this is <laughs> this is so not like what we've been talking about. 59. <laughs> what do you reckon, Chris? What what's 59 in music? 59 is like the 59 Chevy, I think. You know, the 59 57 Chevy. Chevy. I'm going to go think, for Simon and cool. Garfunkel. <laughs> the 59th Street Bridge song. <laughs> oh my god! That? But look, just just to make it so not so not poppy, because we got Chris on and we got underground. How about I like I like I like all that feeling groovy stuff. How about Blondie? <laughs> Parallel lines. Side number track one, side two, eleven fifty nine. All right. Yeah, that, that was the stage at which Blondie had kind of lost the plot. Yeah, they know. went disco. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they? they were just I liked it though. I was in Townsville. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Paranoid New Yorkers is what they were. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's been so good. Yeah, it has. And uh, I'll just uh, do the the quick little sign off. Um, once again, thanks to Chris. Check him out. We'll have all these Spotify links for the Wave Riders, um, the Tribesman, the New Christ, the Hitman, Radio Birdman, and Klondike North Forty. Is that still? I think. Uh, well, that was that was just a little project in Australia at that particular time. Yeah. You know, with a, just a group of really, really talented musicians. But, um, you know, that was sort of that was sort of coming out of that era where I was having to decide whether or not I was going to have to be a singer or not. You know, yeah. That, you know, and, and 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 circumstances made it so that I had to be a singer, which I, would, I wouldn't thrust that job on anyone. It's horrible. Chris, your mind must is just sharp as a tack. You have so many bands. I don't know how you freaking remember the words and the things and the chords and things for all the different bands and all the different things you've got you going. Try, it's fantastic. Try, try playing them and singing them at the same time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we'll add a couple of the Wave Rider songs into the Undiscovered and um, Unfiltered and Undiscovered playlist on Spotify, of course. Um, follow us on Facebook, um, YouTube, and TikTok, of, of course. Um, words for to, to sign off. From the great Paul Kelly, find me a bar or a girl or guitar. Now, where do you go on a Saturday night? Get out there and see some music. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. It's been a real honour. And uh, we'll see everyone else next week. Adios. Hasta la próxima. Hasta la próxima. (laughs) I don't know what that means.
conquista tutto. Il lavoro conquista tutto.